Here we go. Good evening to our attendees. Um, we're just going to wait another minute or so to let um, the latecomers join. Um, so we'll start in just a minute. Great, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, my name is Michael Hall. Um, I'm the operations manager here at Benjamin Franklin House in London, uh, Franklin's only remaining home anywhere in the world. Um, tonight I'm joined by Jessica Akel, uh, also for Benjamin Franklin House, um, and Linda Colley. Um, Linda is Shelby M. C. Davies, 1958 professor of history at Princeton University, a long-term fellow in history at SCAS, and current fellow of the Weisenschafts College at Berlin. Uh, a fellow of the British Academy. She's also a former member of the board of the British Library, where in 2008, she organized an exhibition of historical texts to do with rights entitled Taking Liberties, um, opened by the then prime minister. She also served on the research committees of the British Museum and Tate Britain um, and holds seven honorary degrees, of which the last was awarded by the University of Oxford in 2021. The author of seven books, including Britain's Forging the Nation, 1707 to 1837, a winner of the Wilson Prize. She also writes regularly on history and politics for the New York Review of Books, the London Review of Books, and the Guardian and Financial Times newspapers. Her latest work, The Gun, the Ship, and the Pen, Warfare, Constitutions, and the Making of the Modern World, which we'll discuss tonight, um, has just been awarded the 2021 Book of the Year Prize by the International Forum of Constitutionalism. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Linda. Pleasure. Um, the format of tonight's talk, um, Linda will give a presentation of the book. Um, following on that, um, Jessica and Linda will have a brief discussion um, with some questions from our staff, and then we'll turn it over to Q&A from the audience. Um, for the audience members, please feel free uh, during the talk, um, if anything, any questions arise, to pop them into the Q&A function um, or in the chat. Um, and then when we open up the question and answer, answer period, um, I will relay them uh, to Linda uh, to get an answer. So with that, I'll turn it over to Linda now for her presentation. Hello, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, albeit only on Zoom. Um, Benjamin Franklin did many things during the American Revolutionary War, but one of them while he was in Paris as an ambassador was to see to the translation and the distribution of copies of those American state constitutions, which were beginning to appear in the 1770s and after. Now, Franklin, of course, is a printer by initial training. And as I say, he's actively involved in the American Revolutionary War and what comes after. And war and print are themes that run throughout this book, the gun, the ship, and the pen, which I suppose is essentially about spread. The book explores how and why from the mid 18th century, written constitutions setting out the distribution of power and rights and increasingly mass produced by way of print, progressively proliferated across frontiers. So that already by 1914, the start of the First World War, 
This kind of political technology, codified constitutions, could be found in parts of every one of the world's continents. After the First World War, and even more after the Second World War, the rate of spread quickened further. So much so that now, in the early 21st century, there are only three states left on the globe, one of which, of course, is the UK, that lacks a written constitution. So how does this happen? Well, partly because the gun, the ship, and the pen is a work of global history. It differs in some respects from other studies of constitutions. Most such studies have focused on the constitutional experiences of a single nation. But this book examines constitutions across time through trans regional and transcontinental lenses. And I chose to do this for two reasons. First, advocates and writers of constitutions have always tended to borrow ideas and provisions from other countries. So taking a global format helps one see how this happens, how one country takes inspirations, sometimes even vocabulary, for its constitution from another, sometimes more than one. This is, this is borrowing constantly going on. The second way I wanted to write this book differently was to get away from what I might call the beauty pageant idea of written constitutions, the idea that, you know, the essential thing to do was to find out which was best. Um, I didn't want to do this because in practice, constitutions have served multiple functions. Uh, they can't just be looked at through one criterion. Let me give you an example, which you may find controversial. Um, some historians of the United States have often celebrated the marked long longevity of the American federal constitution, and it is the oldest surviving constitution in the world, of course. And some have also poured scorn on the quick fire turnover of constitutions in South America, suggesting that this is a sign that, you know, the South Americans couldn't really get their act together. But it's more complicated than that. Is longevity of a constitution always a good idea? Jefferson, remember, thought that constitutions should shift every 17 or 18 years or so to keep in touch with a changing society. Perhaps that should happen. But also while South America's constantly changing landscape of constitutions in some ways gives rise to instability. What it also did in the 19th century was to make parts of South America very democratic indeed, for men anyway. Uh, they were constantly issuing new constitutions and this drove up the size and variety of the electorate. So parts of South America are much more democratic in terms of range of voters by 1850 than the United States and most of Europe. Another way that this book tries to ask questions about constitutions and see, well, what makes a good and important constitution is again, 
to look at this issue of duration. Tunisia's constitution of 1861 is the first modern written constitution to appear in a Muslim country. But it doesn't last very long. Um, it, it ends in 1864. So does that mean we dismiss that Tunisian constitution and say it wasn't very important? I don't think so, because it became a part of Tunisian memory. Um, and it's been argued in the recent Arab Spring, in which Tunisia is one of the few parts of North Africa which has kept some of the achievements of the Arab Spring. That one reason for that are these popular memories of the 1861 constitution, short lived but still important. Now, in order to track the spread of these extraordinary devices in the gun, the ship, and the pen, I don't start with the United States. I rather start in the mid 1750s with the radical constitution of Corsica in 1755, put together by a soldier called Pascal Paoli. Um, and I wanted to start with the Corsican constitution to stress that these things are getting going in the mid 18th century. They don't have to wait for 1776. But also I stressed the soldier power because war is a running thread in this book. War as a precipitant of constitutions. Why does warfare um, start triggering these devices from the mid 18th century? Well, partly because war is getting more wide range, it's getting more expensive, it's needing more men. And one of the reasons why some states are increasingly generating a written constitution is as a kind of contract that you get, uh, you issue a constitution promising the vote to adult males or some of them in return for them agreeing to serve in the military in time of war and to pay greater taxes. So it's a deal. And you can see uh, that deal operating increasingly over time. Warfare has affected the result of constitutions in other ways. <laughs> Military defeat, for instance, has often been a spur to a new constitution. Um, a defeated regime may want to issue a new constitution uh, to redeem itself, to re-legitimize itself, and I'll give lots of examples of that. And sometimes, of course, defeated countries have constitutions imposed on them by the conquerors. That happened in Germany and Japan after the Second World War. But it also happened much earlier when Napoleon charges through continental Europe before 1815, making lots of conquests and often giving those conquests a new written constitution. Uh, this is crucial to written constitutions really becoming embedded in parts of Europe. Another point that I wanted to make um, was, of course, the gender results of this, precisely because these documents are so often caught up with war. They tend, when they emerge, and for a long time after, to prioritize males. 
uh, this is the deal. Um, we will give you the vote. We will give you concessions. You will serve in the army or navy. You will pay taxes. That rather skims over women. And what you find is that until the First World War, very few countries, uh, there's a few in the Pacific world like New Zealand, which are an exception, but most countries still in 1914 haven't enfranchised females. And it really needs women's involvement in the First World War to change that. And, and you see after the First World War, constitutions, new constitutions beginning to recognize the participation and rights of women. Other points I will underline, we can pull out a lot more in the questions, I hope, is that this is very much uh, a book about people, not just documents. Um, I wanted to get away from the notion that the history of constitutions was rather arid and austere and legalistic by looking at the very different kinds of people who generated the constitutions over time. Many of these early constitution writers were, as you would expect from the importance of war, soldiers. Uh, this is true of George Washington with the American constitution, uh, chairing the Philadelphia Convention in 1787. It's true of Bolivar in uh, much of South America, very interested in new constitutions, writes some as well. Um, and it's true of somebody you may not have heard of, uh, Ito Hurubumi, who is the author of the first Japanese constitution in 1889, something I talk about towards the end of the book. And this Japanese constitution is really important because it's the first successful constitution in Asia. Um, it's very influential, uh, not just, not so much in Europe or in America, but in the Ottoman world uh, and among nationalists in Egypt uh, and China and India, who see it as proof uh, that constitutions, political modernity are beginning to spread eastwards. Um, so this Japanese constitution is very, very uh, crucial. Um, and I enjoyed writing about it. Um, final point I want to make before I conclude is that I've always thought it's a shame that written constitutions are looked at usually in separation from other kinds of literature. Um, and this is wrong because in fact, again, if you look at the different people who generated constitutions, many of them are engaged in different kinds of writing. Ito Hirabumi in Japan, for instance, um, yes, he plays the dominant role in this big Japanese constitution, but he also writes poetry. He's interested in words and literature. Um, and there's a huge overlap between constitutions and other kinds of literature too, in terms that they're both dependent on print. Uh, there's no point really having these kind of constitutions, unless you can distribute them widely and unless they can be easily read by multitudes of people. So let me just bring my comments to the end by saying that although I stress their often very close connection with warfare, 
And although I make it clear that constitutions have not always been all that benevolent, um, some of them are uh, very racist documents, they exclude non-white people as well as non-male people often. Nonetheless, um, this book tries to underline the significance of these extraordinary devices in world history. And we need to think about that hard in the present day when authoritarian and populist governments are expanding in number and when print is giving way to digital. Uh, one of the issues that I touch on at the end of this book um, is how the coming of digital technology, uh, the fact that we more often look at screens now perhaps than paper and print, how this is going to impact on the future of this extraordinary political and legal and inspirational device, the written constitution. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Linda. That was, uh, yeah, really interesting to listen to. And um, of course, I really enjoyed um, reading the book as well. Um, I thought probably like many people, um, the US constitution kind of sticks out in people's minds. Um, they think that this perhaps is like the only one. Um, and I was just um, kind of wondering, why do, you, why do you think we all still know about the US constitution, but none of the others? Well, of course, um... I think we've got to qualify that a bit. Um, uh, Americans clearly know a lot and prioritize the uh, constitution. Though it's been suggested by uh, American historians who've done research that it really isn't till about 1850 that the kind of cult of the American constitution drafted in 1787 really takes off. Before that, many Americans, it's been suggested, gave more attention to their state constitution because that was the one that affected them most. And in fact, I mean, we, we you know, when you go to Washington, um, uh, often people see uh, the original manuscript of the draft constitution from 1787 and it's become a kind of shrine. Um, but before the Second World War, it, it was very different. It was not always on show. And sometimes they actually lost it. Um, there were various stages when they put the manuscript in, in boxes and trunks, in basements, in official buildings in Washington and they forget, forgot where it was. So um, attitudes to the American constitution have changed over. But to answer your question as to why um, it got a lot of attention, well, partly because it did survive. It's not just its provisions, it's, it is its survival. Um, and also American activists like Ben Franklin were extremely busy in circulating information about it, getting it translated, have it printed in different parts of the world. The United States wanted very clear that it had arrived on the political stage and it used its constitution and it used print to help achieve this. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you're saying about how constitutions are a type of literature. And of course, Benjamin Franklin himself was was a writer. That was his profession. Um, so, yeah, it's really interesting to think about how his influence over the printing press kind of um, helped to circulate the US Constitution. Um, you um, 
I really liked in the book how you do kind of um, talk about the smaller players and and all the other constitutions that are um, relatively unknown um, to, coming from our perspective. Um, I was just wondering how important was it to to include these stories for you? Well, it was it was very important to me because I wanted to stress diversity. And I wanted to look at parts of the world that are often neglected. Um, so one of my chapters starts with Pitcairn Island in the South Pacific, which is where the mutineers from the Bounty and their Tahitian companions eventually end up. Um, and by the 1830s, these mixed race people, and there's only about 100 of them left, um, really feel they, they they want a government, they want a document to validate who they are. Um, and a Scottish Royal Navy captain sails into Pitcairn and says, well, okay, I'll write you something, which he does. And this comes to be called the Pitcairn Constitution. And what is extraordinary about it, it's the first document in world history to give women the vote permanently on the same basis as men. So Pitcairn is something of a beacon in gender terms, even though it's tiny. Um, similarly, Corsica is quite small, and yet its 1755 constitution is extraordinarily democratic though in this case just for males yeah absolutely and um you talk a lot about actually how um constitutions are often seen as kind of um uh, documents of democracy um however they actually can also serve to exclude people um can you just talk a little bit more about that yeah um well, I, I mean, I pointed out that most constitutions before the First World War um, leave out women. And you could argue, well, there's nothing new. I mean, women have usually been excluded up to that point. But constitutions, written constitutions, in some respects make it worse because, of course, these are documents written into law um, and therefore they can cement female exclusion uh, and for a while they do but the other way that constitutions exclude is um, in many cases against indigenous people um, and you see that increasingly in the United States in the 19th century, um, Native Americans really left out of the game, even when um, the Cherokee, who are mainly based in Georgia, in 1827, tried to capitalize on the fact that they've got a written language, they've got access to print. So, hey, what they're going to do is issue their own constitution to signal the fact that they are a separate nation and this stretch of land is theirs. Um, they print it, they issue it, uh, but it's just swept away. It's swept away by the Georgia legislature and by Washington. So um, here's an example of a constitution that fails. And it's an example of how white regimes sometimes used these devices to exclude and marginalize people of a different sort. And um, just kind of following on from that, I mean, of course, the US Constitution has only been amended, I think, 27 times, perhaps. Um, it, which is quite a small amount, uh, thinking about how long it's been around for. Um, it's just kind of thinking, what do you think this should be um, updated anymore? Do you think any more amendments are coming? 
Um, I think, and I know some um, Americanists like Jill Lepore, who writes for The New Yorker, um, think and argue that there should be more amendments to the American Constitution. Um, if you look at the other, the second long lived constitution, which is the Norway Constitution of 1814, they're constantly amending that. Um, and, you know, as I said, Jefferson thought this was a good idea. The problem, though, um, and Americans listening will know this better than I, that in the current political state of the USA, how would you get amendments through? Uh, in the past, in American history, it's often needed a war to generate real constitutional shift. So obviously, black access to the vote, again, just for males, um, becomes pushed at least to a degree by the American Civil War. Women get advantage from American involvement in the First World War. But when you don't have a real um, existential threat like that to change things, how do you persuade politicians to focus on changing a document? Um, and <clears throat> they haven't worked it out in Washington yet. Yeah, kind of interestingly linked to that as well. Obviously, we are both uh, British, <laughs> um, as our as our kind of half our audience, I expect. Um, do you think the UK will ever have one? Um, it's possible. Um, certainly, if Scotland gets another vote on independence and this time votes to secede from the UK, the Scottish National Party have already said that they want a codified constitution. Uh, and of course, it's also possible in the future that Northern Ireland will decide to rejoin the rest of Ireland, in which case you'll have to have a new Irish constitution. Um, and so all you'd have remaining of the UK in that case would be England and perhaps Wales. I suspect that would be such a shock that there would be real pressure for constitutional change in London as well. But we'll have to see. <laughs> and uh, how, how difficult do you think it would be to draft a constitution today? Um, I know you mentioned the rise of digital in your book. Um, just how, how do you think that will affect how we go about writing constitutions in the future? Here in, U here in the UK? Um, yeah, and, and worldwide as well. Well, of course, one of the difficulties, it's not just digital and political disagreements. It's also that you can't draft a constitution anymore like they did in Philadelphia in 1787, when you just got about 50 affluent and elitish white males shutting themselves away for three months and saying, this is what's going to happen. Uh, OK, it was ratified. Um, but the American Constitution was very much uh, a minority production. Uh, we live in totally different societies now. So how it's not just how do you get people to engage with an existing constitution, how do you change drafting a constitution so that so-called ordinary people feel that they've got some stake in the process? Great, yeah, really interesting to see kind of what, what the future what the future holds. Um, I think we've got some audience questions coming through, so I'm going to hand over to the audience um, just so that we make sure we get through them. Um, Michael, do you want to take over? Um, yeah, so you've You've sort of answered part of this question, but um, do you think the US will ever update or reword their constitution? 
Um, and I would sort of add to that, if you can envision a way that the US Constitution could be amended to include sort of more, more voices um, than it did originally. Well, um, it has been amended um, to include more voices in terms of votes uh, and access to the votes, Native Americans, Blacks, women, um, different in the states now have access to the franchise, obviously. Um, but how, how do you amend it more radically? For example, one of the things that many recent constitutions in Canada and South America have done is, for example, put rulings about the treatment of the environment in a constitution. Um, doing that, I think, would be a very good idea in the United States and elsewhere. But again, how do you mobilize agreement on that? Um, and of course, in the United States, you've got the issue of the gun laws and the endless arguments about uh, whether the original constitution drafted in 1787 means that Washington must leave the gun laws alone. Um, this will run and run. Um. Another question, uh, who was the in individual you most enjoyed finding out about? Oh, um, that's, that's really difficult because there were so many. Um, I suppose one of the people I really enjoyed writing about, not necessarily my favorite, but one of my favorites um, was Catherine the Great of Russia, who in the 1760s, I mean, it's not a constitution, but Catherine drafts and plans what she calls the Nakaz or Grand Instruction. And it's intended as a complete rewrite of Russian law, but also ventures into areas like improving social welfare, um, making sure that education is widespread and so forth. Um, and it shows Catherine playing with the idea again of a well-publicized printed document and and she has it translated into different languages to um, boost her reputation to boost russia's reputation uh, and to change how things are also. now um it never happens because uh catherine gets involved in other things including warfare um but Catherine is a remarkable woman and has remarkable ideas. And one of the things I wanted to do, uh, many people have become obsessed and always have been obsessed with Catherine's fairly riotous private life. Um, I wanted to talk about her brain and her mind and her ideas. Um, and trying to revise views of her, I really enjoyed doing. Also, she gave me a female activist uh, at a time when most activists were male. Yeah, I, I, did, I really excited. enjoyed that part of the book. <laughs> I was very excited when Netflix, I think it was Netflix announced their um, show about Catherine the Great and was a little bit disappointed, even though it was very entertaining that that the majority of it was fictionalized in a way that I thought really sort of diminished um, the impact that she did actually have uh, in the world. Um, uh, the next question is, did your research for the book turn up anything unexpected? Oh, um, it was 
non-stop really. Um, I suppose all authors say that, but um, I will certainly say it and believe it. Partly because as I said in my talk at the beginning, most people focus on the constitution of just one country. Whereas I was looking at a range of these documents and not just the ones from important countries, or the ones that survived. I was looking at a whole variety of texts and discovering ones that were barely known or had been completely forgotten. And also looking at the people who got caught up in their writing and propagation. And that interest, introduced me to um, a lot of uh, individuals that I just hadn't studied before. So it was this medley of documents, but also a medley of people. Great. Um, this one is a multi-part question. Um, what is the most common way in which a nation, either with or without a constitution, handles commitments agreed to under international treaties? Um, and in a dispute, does a constitution always have a precedence or does the issue simply end up in the highest court in the country as a rule? Well, I, I suspect there's um, a, a certain amount of uh, reflection on current events behind that question. Um, it partly depends how comprehensive the constitution is. Um, given that these documents are sometimes old, perhaps not as old as the United States document, but still not recent, new things are constantly going to come up unless you keep it amended, uh, which are not in the Constitution. Um, and that's a problem. Uh, there's a problem with organizations of Supreme Courts, um, how effective uh, and how open-minded are these institutions. Um, and then it's the question of enforcement and it's the question of political ideas. One of the reasons, only one of the reasons why the UK does not have a codified constitution is that it's got this very long lasting convention that parliamentary sovereignty comes first. Therefore, that there can be no written constitution which overrides parliament. Uh, parliament, the majority of parliament makes every decision afresh and it can change its mind. So that you don't have a codified constitution hanging around and saying, no, you can't do this, you must do that because parliament can always make new laws. Now, uh, apologists say this makes for very flexible government that can always change. For some opponents, uh, this is part of the problem. Um, that government is not being held to answer uh, and parliament is always shifting the ground. So um, this is a very, very weighty argument. Great. Um, and uh, a sort of another big question. Um, the American founding fathers were deeply studied in the classics, uh, specifically Roman law. Uh, and had fears of standing armies and other issues. Are other constitutions around the world beyond the West uh, also influenced by classical uh, Rome and Greece? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, not perhaps as much as of the American constitution, but obviously in the second half of the 18th century, early 19th century, throughout the 19th century in many areas, elite males, prosperous males 
tend to study the Greek and Roman classics. Um, this is true even of um, some colonial spaces like the Indian subcontinent where elite figures like Nehru are familiar with uh, the Greek and Roman classics. That's an influence, there's no doubt about that. But what I think is shifting increasingly after 87, and it's even in evidence before, is that you've got so many other political constitutions becoming available, uh, being printed, being translated. So when guys sit round a table and say, you know, we really need a new constitution, they may remember the Greek and Roman classics, but increasingly, they're also saying, hey, um, can we see a copy of the last Dutch constitution or uh, the recent constitution issued in Chicago or something like that? Um, and constitutions become, in some ways, like patchwork qu quilts. Um, their makers are often taking bits from different things, different materials, if you like, and putting it together. And that's always happened. So uh, the great Indian constitution put together in 1949, 1950, 60% um, of that is taken from uh, legislative documents uh, produced by the British and Indian allies in the 1930s. But Indians in the late 1940s often also taking material from the United States, from Canada, from Australia, from their own Indian writings and political traditions and laws. So the Indian constitution, which is huge, is, is a hodgepodge. Um, and when you've got that kind of situation, one particular type of source like the Greek and Roman classics is obviously much less important. Wonderful. Um, well, that's all the audience questions so far, unless anyone has uh, one that they want to pop in sort of really quickly. Um, thank you very much, Linda. That was a really interesting talk um, and I enjoyed hearing about everything. Um, I just want to point out to everybody, um, if you um, enjoyed this talk and you want to um, uh, join us for our next um, Ben's Book Club. We'll also be looking at constitutional history um, with Mary Sarah Builder, um, the author of Female Genius. Um, and that will be on Wednesday, July 13th um, at 5 p.m. Uh, British Standard Time, uh, British Summer Time, sorry. Um, and uh, the link for registration is live on our website um, if you want to register now. So thank you very much, Linda. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.